Hi, my name is Will, and I've been a software developer since the 90s. Everything from startups to Fortune 500, including running a technology consulting company with about 85 developers. The last few months, I've been talking to a lot of other developers, as well as tech recruiters, and I thought it'd be a good idea to pass along a summary of some of the conversations I've been having. So first up, we are in a tech job recession, at least for coders. Uh, here's an example, check out layoffs.fyi as a tracker, and you can kind of see the scale and scope of what's going on. There are other sectors that are hiring right now, but tech is going through a rough spot. So that said, obviously, if you can do any face-to-face -face networking, that's going to work out better than trying to go online. You can send in online resumes, you can click the apply now button on LinkedIn, but you have to assume that for any role, especially if it's remote, there will be hundreds of applicants. Right now, Indeed.com and LinkedIn are the two main online resources. The other one I've seen a lot of people have some success with is Reddit for specialty stuff, and also some social media like Mastodon is pretty friendly for tech-specific stuff. I've seen stats showing that anywhere from 75-80% of the people out there are worried about getting laid off in 2024. Uh, that's a lot of fear right now. I've also seen similar stats for people who want to switch jobs. So there's not a lot of loyalty right now on both sides. And I suspect that's part of what's driving a lot of the applicants clicking those buttons. So it's part of what's also driving the noise. Another component of that is both the recruiters and the candidates are using AI for everything. Uh, your resume, your cover letters, they may not be writing it, but you certainly want to be using things to either summarize or get more feedback or get reviews of your resumes. There are actually companies out there that are doing things like using an AI to submit a resume off to hundreds of or thousands of companies at once. So it's getting a little strange out there. And that's another reason why you're seeing so many people applying for any roles that are open. One strategy to get around that is try to give a presentation at a user group. That's a good way to introduce yourself to a lot of people and it can kick off conversations. The other thing is, even if you're not for giving a presentation, good recruiters still do go to face-to-face -face meetups. So usually at a minimum, somebody's gonna have a role, a recruiter will have a role and that's why they'll go to a meetup. So you might cut yourself down from again, one in 200 to one in five or 10. So highly recommend if it's an option for you, go to meetups. Another one that I will throw out is think about yourself as both having a skill set and that involves both the domain and the function. For example, you're not just a Java developer. You're a Java developer that happens to work for a giant retailer. So if you can find another company that's a giant retailer that might be looking for a developer, even if it's not Java, you might have a chance to make a pivot there. If you have both, if you have both the function and the domain at the same time and you apply for a role, that will almost certainly put you at the top of the pile. So try to think a little creatively about your domain and your role to think about how you can kind of pop yourself into these different positions. I mentioned Reddit earlier. That's an example of something similar to that. For example, let's say that you're really interested in genetics, right? So if you post on the Java developer forum that you're looking for a role, but you have a background in genetic research for the kind of work that you're doing, you might want to also try posting in the genetics forum to say, hey, I'm a developer looking with an interest in this field. And there you'll be more unusual and you might get fast-tracked in to different roles. So try to think creatively even in how you present it and where you go online, not just face-to-face. -face. You might like AI, you may hate AI, and specifically I'm talking about LLMs and large language model stuff. Um, that said, it is a really powerful tool. If you're not interested in using a server-based one like ChatGPT or something, I highly recommend taking a little time to download and play with one of the local LLMs. That's basically just a file that you can run on your local computer. And as long as you have a halfway decent computer, um, you can play around with them. So no matter what, you want to get some exposure because it is such a big part of what people are talking about and a lot of the kinds of work that are coming up right now. So at a minimum, if you have an existing piece of software and you just add natural language user interface to that, that's really cool. And you can do that with a local LLM. You can download open source ones for free. 
and the APIs to integrate between a Java application and some of these LMs are not that complicated. So take the time, pull it down, play with it, have some fun. The next one, this is a little different angle on it, but it's sort of more back on the recruiter side. One of the complaints I hear from folks is I sent my resume in and I didn't get anything back from the recruiting team. And part of the issue there is the recruiters are sort of sitting as the interface for what can be a lot of bureaucracy within the company, number one. So for example, let's say somebody opens up a role looking for a Java developer. Maybe they fill that specific role, but they then roll into another opening that they want later. So what happens is, is the recruiters are less likely to want to send a kill note, like send the letter saying, hey, we're done, if they think there's any chance that, hey, maybe it might be something else. So obviously, if a recruiter's both getting hundreds of applications in and there's not really a lot of upside to sending out the kill letter, that's why you can get this delay. Don't take it personally. I mean, this is probably the, the one thing I would say more than anything else. These recruiters are just kind of the interface for what's going on with the back end with the companies. Be nice to the recruiters. They're doing their job. They are often operating in um, just like you, where they don't know what's going on with their roles or they don't know what's getting filled or what's going on with pipeline. But recruiters want to place you. A lot of recruiters even get commissioned for placing someone into the role. So that, trust me, they are invested in trying to make that happen. Um, so just think through and like I said, just stay chill with, with the recruiters. Okay, so when I talk to the recruiters and I say, hey, look, if you've got Java on your resume already, what else should you do? Number one thing that keeps coming up is cloud deployment. So this is actually kind of murky to me because a lot of these jobs, they might nominally look like they're a Java developer job, but really what they are is they're like a DevOps role. And this gets kind of interesting. Like one of my friends that is working today that is the most secure in his job, it's because he's doing cloud migration work that involves shutting down servers and reducing the applications. So even though his job background is as a Java developer, his actual job work is mostly doing cost containment and management. So he's actually stripping stuff out. So things like knowing how to, at a, at a baseline, package up a Java application into a Docker image, maybe also link that in with the database and then push that up to a hosting company. Those kinds of skills are not necessarily what I would think of as a Java developer role off the fr at first, but the problem is, is if you don't know what the apps are doing, you can't understand the code underneath or how to tweak the app to get it to run in a different environment. It's sort of this murky, weird halfway point. So look at the job descriptions carefully. Uh, for example, you might think that you're coming to go work on a Spring Boot app, but really what you're doing is just dealing with a lot of migrations of microservices or something. So pay attention to it and kind of embrace it. Like, you know, at the end of the day, if that's where the work is and the money is, then maybe that's something that you should look at. So the next one after the cloud deployment stuff, which includes things like Docker and Kubernetes basics, at least. The other one is full stack. That's the next thing that the recruiters are citing as how somebody who's a developer kind of pushes up. So for a long time now, Java developers have really focused just on building backend services, data pipelines, and REST services in particular. So front end gets murky. Now I'm going to go give you two tips. One of them is if you have a traditional Java application, maybe it's old like struts or something, or even a new modern one that was Spring Boot, and you want to put a UI into it with something like Timeleaf, I highly recommend checking out this package called HTMX. What HTMX lets you do is add a little bit of interactivity to your application by allowing you to swap out chunks of HTML in the, in the front end. So if you're using something like Timeleaf, it's really nice and easy. You basically can add something called a Timeleaf partial um, to the template, and that becomes just a little chunk of the HTML. And then as the user works with the app, they can, re can update. So if you're looking at getting started out on front end work, check out something like Timeleaf, an HTMX, you can add Alpine JS, and some CSS. And there's some things called classless CSS where you add it to the app and it makes things look really nice without having to kind of reinvent the wheel. So that's kind of the way that I would recommend someone who's been doing server-side development for a long time and maybe is kind of like, I don't really even like JavaScript or front-end work, but you want to build some basic UIs. Okay, now the other end of the spectrum on this is actually learning full-blown modern JavaScript frameworks. Now, 
I, like a lot of Java developers, was pretty loath to want to get into JavaScript and TypeScript and all that stuff. But in 2023, I wanted to build and deploy some apps. And I just couldn't go deploy, deploy to the places I wanted to deploy with, with Java. It was just not going to work out. For example, I want to use edge servers for deploying the web app. I want to have a much richer, more interactive experience, something like a spa. And so I wound up settling on using SvelteKit. And SvelteKit is a full stack, modern, batteries included, great developer experience, TypeScript framework. And I was really surprised at how much I liked it. I was able to both build and deploy one app to the web with Vercel, and then also take the same app and package it up with Capacitor to run on mobile. And I could use something like Tori to make a desktop app. And honestly, modern TypeScript was great. I really, really liked it. I was really surprised. I'm still using JetBrains IDEs to work with it. So if you're an IntelliJ person, I was using WebStorm just to kind of keep the plugins separated. But I cannot recommend enough checking out something like SvelteKit. Um, it's the one that is topping all the JavaScript developer surveys for the, the nicest framework to work with. Um, the other UI framework out there, React, I think is a lot clunkier and harder to work with, but here's what's really cool. You could start playing around with SvelteKit today, and the same things that you learn will translate over to something like React. You'll just see a lot more code in it. So there's this website, Component Party, and Component Party kind of highlights the differences and also sort of acts a little bit like a Rosetta Stone between all these JavaScript frameworks. And since they move so fast anyways, my take is we'll start with Svelte and SvelteKit, and then that'll be the easiest one to get started with. And then if you need to or want to pivot to other things, that's fine. Certainly most folks in the front end world have heard of Svelte and SvelteKit now. It does support both fully running as spa mode. You can use it for server side only. You can do hybrid out of the box. Like I said, the TypeScript stuff's really nice and it's really easy to integrate vanilla JavaScript stuff with it too. And you can deploy it everywhere. It's, it's great. Okay, the next one, and this one I think is sort of a no-brainer, but I'm just going to throw out there is SQL and relational databases. If you happen to have been at a company that's using a NoSQL non-relational data store of some kind, but you don't have relational on your resume, that's going to be a huge challenge. Personally, I think Postgres is a great foundation. You can get free hosted Postgres with Superbase. You can download and play with it locally. And if you're on the Mac, you can download a pre-built Postscript app that just it just runs like an app. And it's super easy to get started. You should know how to use all the relational database stuff with things like Spring Data. Um, that's sort of the baseline. And SQL's going to be around forever. It'll be around probably long after I'm dead. Last point, uh, this recession's probably going to last at least a year or two. Um, timing these things and making predictions about markets is always really hard. We know that a lot of the CEOs right now have taken a tack of saying things like, you know, they still want to hit their numbers for profitability improvements. So what they're going to do, what they've kind of, a lot of them have done is said, well, we're going to try to reduce our staff load. So if you can cut your staff 10%, that's a really easy way to hit boosting your profitability numbers. And this is where the, it gets a little murky because some of this is related to rates because if the Federal Reserve has higher rates, then that means that the companies have more challenges accessing cash to put into growth, which is where belt tightening seems like, you know, you go to your investors or, what, or, the, or the, the Wall Street folks and you can say, hey, look, I'm trying to be good about the money that I'm spending. So instead of putting it on salaries for tech staff, I'm going to cut that back a little bit. And this has a knock-on effect. And what I mean by that is if the overall tech sector drops 10% in terms of its overall employment level, that has an outsized impact on salaries and the ability for labor to negotiate with the employers for, for getting good packages. Combine that with remote work where effectively you're competing with the whole planet for a remote job, which is the downside of people switching to work from home. So you combine those two factors and what it means is, is that you're likely to probably be able to find remote roles, for example, but maybe they don't pay as well. So this is all of a, a kind of a murky, complicated set of issues. But from a high level, I would say expect that it's at least going to be a year or two before the tech sector is going to get better, which means that if you can find a job, 
you probably should take it, even if it's not your dream job, and expect to hang out there six months to a year or two, and then wait and then pivot into a better role. Um, generically speaking, if you're just starting out, you're going to want at least three years on your resume. And so that's part of also the challenge there is just you want to get the time in. Um, but if you're more experienced and more senior, then the flip is, is just simply it boils down to, are, can you take a two year gap in salary? Because once you start getting past that six month mark, it can get really hard to get that, that next job or that next role. And the next side, a lot of you might be thinking that it might be fun to go out and do something entrepreneurial. I'm just going to say that almost there's a lot of people in tech who are having the same problem right now, and they all come up with that answer of doing something entrepreneurial and the market's just kind of saturated. Um, by example, I've re I've had reports that show that the number of people installing new apps on their phone is at an all time low. Um, the, uh, the video game market right now, which I've built and ship a title in, in that space, uh, there's thousands of games that come out on steam, like every month right now. So think through, if you want to do something entrepreneurial, think about it carefully and, and I cannot emph emphasize enough that if you don't have an existing marketing option, social media, something, a big mailing list think really hard about doing something entrepreneurial, especially uh, on your own. All right. I know I dropped a lot of stuff on here really fast. I hope this was helpful for you. And uh, if you like this kind of thing, of course, give me a comment. Let me know. Thank you so much for taking the time, all the usual things like liking and subscribing and all that fun stuff and share with your friends. Um, anyway, thank you so much and uh, take care. Talk to you later.